Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe glory to the Lord's name. Good morning and welcome to Chapel by the Sea. So glad you turned up on this Sunday, the last Sunday in August, the year of our Lord, 2017. So welcome. Um, if you're visiting with us today, I want to extend a very special welcome to you. We're so glad that you're here. Um, following the service, we would like to invite you in our friendship foyer to join us for orange juice and some friendship and fun. In the pew rack in front of you, you'll find a card. I invite you to put your name and your information there so we can have a record of your visit as well as know how we might be able to reach out and minister to you. So welcome, friends. Glad that you're here. A couple of announcements today. Um, following the service, we're, we're going to have a crime prevention lecture. But it's not just a boring lecture. I hear there's going to be a little bit of fun. Um, so you'll learn how to prevent crime, and especially you might be interested in identity theft protection. So that'll be one of the topics that'll be covered. There's some information in the friendship for you as you're grabbing your orange juice. And the presentation will be held in our chapel hall immediately following the service. I think that's all I'm going to announce today, so I want to tell you a little bit, give you a preview of the service today. We're going to be looking at the church and the foundation for the church, and I might even convince you that you are a part of God's foundation for building up the church into the future. So as we sing the songs of the foundation and Christ the solid rock, I encourage you to think about what that means for you, what it means for your life today. So welcome, friends. Take a deep breath. Remember that God is here, that God is love. Let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. morning. Please join me as we read responsibly the call to worship. Come along with me as a sojourner in faith. Bring along a sense of expectancy, a vision of high hopes, a glimpse of future possibility, a vivid imagination, for God's creation is not done. We are called to pioneer a future yet unnamed as 
we venture forward, we leave behind our desires for a no-risk life, worldly accumulations, certainty. Let us travel light in the spirit of faith and expectation toward the God of our hopes and dreams. May we witness to God's future breaking in. Come along with me as sojourners in faith, secure in the knowledge that we never travel alone. Please join me with the invocation. O oh Lord, we give you this hour to show our thanks and sing your praise. We give you our work, knowing that you will fulfill our promises. We give you our time, asking you to guide us in what is good and acceptable and perfect. We give you our friends and families, seeking to follow your example of how to love and bless them. We give you our lives, trusting that you will not forsake the work of your hands. All that we are and all that we have is yours. Receive it to your glory and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
That's what it takes, and I'll be willing to do it. It takes a lot for us to run the church, to be able to reach out into the community, and to share God's blessings. So please be generous with your morning offering.
Today, as we go to the Lord in prayer, I invite you to continue praying for Martha Zell's brother out in California. And let us not forget to pray for our brothers and sisters in Texas, struggling with the results in the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. We're not taking a collection, but you may feel compelled to help out. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, I understand uh, donating blood is a way to help, as there may be a shortage. Let us pray. O oh God, mysterious and holy, we offer you this day our prayers of adoration, acknowledging that all of creation is yours, the earth, the moon, the stars, the light of your glory is more radiant than even the sun, more amazing than a total eclipse. Today we confess our shortcomings. We have turned our gaze from the light of your love to the darkness around and within, allowing our thoughts to stray from you, allowing our compassion to falter, allowing our egos to have their way. Our egos that shout over the still, small voice of love speaking to us from within. Forgive us our wanderings and receive us back into your arms of love. Help us always to be thankful for your mercy, your compassion, and your grace extended to all people. Yes, even to us. Today we hold our neighbors in Texas before you, those caught up in the floods, those first responders working tirelessly to help those in distress. We pray, O oh Lord, especially for the poor, the vulnerable, and those fearful to seek help. Those on the margins affected the most in times of natural disaster. And we pray for people of faith, for churches in Texas to be a refuge and a help for their neighbors affected. We pray, O oh Lord, for our nation, anxious and divided. May the church, may we be a voice of hope in these troubling days. And we pray for ourselves, for our loved ones. You know the cry of our hearts, O oh Lord. And so now we offer to you our most personal of prayers in this silence. And praying the prayer our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
You may be seated. Our scripture passage today, we continue in the Gospel of Matthew. Today, reading from Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. You can find this in your pew Bibles on page 798. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Thanks be to God for the reading of God's word. Thank you, choir. I believe there was some foot tapping going on. <laughs> so a couple, three weeks ago now, I was with a group of pastors from the area. 
And one of the pastors said, well, you know Tampa Bay area is not the Bible Belt. To which another of the pastors turned to me and he said, and Clearwater really isn't the Bible Belt. The conversation moved on quickly because preachers like to talk. There we go. (laughs) And it moved so quickly that I wasn't able to ask him exactly what he meant by that comment. The clear water really isn't the Bible Belt, leaving me to wonder what he meant. And I'm not sure, but I think that maybe he thought about the different influences in our city that make it difficult to be a congregation that serves Jesus Christ. Maybe. If that's true, I will tell you this, I am not daunted by that. Because Jesus wasn't daunted by that. Let me tell you what I mean. In the scripture passage today, Jesus and his disciples are in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now that probably doesn't mean much to most people here today, We don't hear about Caesarea Philippi today, but if you were a Jew living first century, for Jesus to take his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, that would have caused some eyebrows to raise for a couple of reasons. One is that this was a Roman imperial city. What was Jesus doing there? The Romans, of course, were the occupying force, and most Jews really despised the Romans, so they were in enemy territory. And second of all, and maybe more importantly, Caesarea Philippi was known as the center of cultic worship for the Greek god Pan. And on a cliff overlooking the city, the people would worship Pan by building shrines and and temples to this god Pan. And the city sat at the bottom of this cliff, and at the bottom of the cliff there was a cave out of which spring waters flowed. And the locals called that cave the Gates of Hell because they believed that the fertility gods used that as their entrance to the underworld. And that's where they would go during the winter and then when springtime would come back around, the fertility gods would come back up. Now, this is where the conversation turns PG-13. I hope you can handle it. If not, earmuffs. Ready? Okay. So you can only imagine how the people of the area worshipped these fertility gods. I'm not going to spell it out for you. But I will say that goats were involved and they weren't making goat cheese. Can we move on now? Let's move on. And so this is where Jesus decided to take his disciples. Can you imagine the eyebrows raised? This is the place where Jesus first mentions the building of his church, Caesarea Philippi. Coincidence? I don't think so. I think Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he said, upon this rock I will build my church. Now, I will tell you that over the centuries, Christians have disagreed. Can you believe that? Christians disagreeing? And they have disagreed over the interpretation of this passage. So it's the part where Jesus looks at Peter and the disciples and he says, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, good old impetuous Peter, says, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed are you. I'm going to change your name from Simon to Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What did Jesus mean? Christians have battled over the centuries. The Catholics say, well, upon Peter, the man, Christ would build his church, lending itself to the papal succession. So every bishop of Rome since Peter has been the pope. Other Christians, mainline Christians, say, well, yeah, maybe it was Peter, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a papal succession. Still other Christians, a lot of evangelicals say, no, it wasn't the man at all, but it was his confession of faith, his confession that Jesus was the Messiah. And still another interpretation, this is the minority report, I've only heard this once from one person, but it was interesting, so I thought I would share. He said, no, 
Maybe Jesus literally meant the rock. That rock overlooking Caesarea Philippi where the idols and and the worship and, and the temples and shrines would be built to pan. Maybe that particular rock Jesus intended to build a literal church. Well, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know who's right or who's wrong, but I will say that usually in situations where people are arguing that both sides may have a little merit. And so let's assume that all of these ideas about what Jesus meant, let's assume that maybe they all point to the truth in some form or fashion. Whatever Jesus meant by that, it is clear that he picked the most irreverent of places and a pretty imperfect person in Peter on which to build his rock. So just to remind you about Peter and all of his many foibles, Peter. Peter was the guy a couple of weeks ago, stepped out of the boat into the water, and then what? Sunk. (laughs) In a couple of verses after the scripture passage we read just now, Jesus would look at Peter and say, Get thee behind me. What? Satan. Jesus called him Satan. Good old Peter. The one who said, no, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus explained to him why he needed to. And Peter said, well, then wash my whole body. And Jesus said, I don't think so. (laughs) My paraphrase. Jesus, the guy that cut off the ear of a Roman soldier. Whoops. (laughs) Sorry about that. Jesus, the one who said, no, Jesus, I'll never deny you. And then later that night, Jesus who? Never heard of him. That's the Peter. That's the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. Maybe Jesus had really bad judgment. Or maybe we do in thinking that God can't use imperfect people to build his kingdom. Let me give you a more modern day example. Most of us have lived when Mother Teresa was alive. Mother Teresa, who founded the Sisters of Charity, 4,500 nuns who served the poorest of the poor. And I'm not talking America poor with the safety net. I'm talking the poorest of the poor. They served and cared for people with HIV and AIDS, people with leprosy, with tuberculosis. The impact of Mother Teresa is unquestioned. But when she died in 1997, not too long after that, some letters of hers were released. Letters that showed that she had a faith marked by doubt. That she wondered if God was there. To put it gently, she wondered if God was real. To put it more bluntly, Yet God used this woman of little faith to impact and change the lives of hundreds, thousands, maybe even into the millions of people. So let me ask you, what's your excuse, huh? What's your excuse? Maybe like Mother Teresa, you say, well, my faith isn't strong enough. Or maybe like the church I served in Tennessee, they would say, well, my body's not young enough. Or maybe my wallet's not big enough. Or my schedule isn't free enough. Maybe my title isn't impressive enough. Or my compassion isn't strong enough. Well, to that, let me read to you this little poem. Rahab lived sultry. David committed adultery. Abraham lied and Jacob vied. And once the weather turned fine, Noah turned to wine. Thomas doubted, Martha pouted, and Elijah spouted. So what's your excuse? If God can use imperfect people like that, to build his kingdom here on earth, what's your excuse? I borrowed something from my three-year-old this morning. 
he likes to watch from the uh, nursery. So, hi, Reese. And he let me borrow his very important and valuable rock collection. So, a few weeks ago, we went on a walk, and he started picking up rocks. And these weren't special rocks. These were pebbles and ordinary gravel, much like this one, just ordinary pieces of rocks. And so his job was to pick up the rocks, and my job was to put them in my pocket and carry them. And by the end of the walk, my pockets were filled with rocks. Nothing special rocks. That was the beginning of his rock coaction. <clears throat> and so a couple of days after his rock collection began, of course, he came back and put them in his Spider-Man bucket. A couple of days after that, we were walking into a restaurant, he picked up another very ordinary piece of gravel, much like this, and he asked me to hold it. Well, Mommy didn't have pockets that day, and so as we walked in, I waited for him to turn his attention, and I simply dropped it back where it went, thinking he would never remember it. Guess what? When we left the restaurant, he said, Mommy, where's my rock? And I said, oh, whoops. <laughs> well, I put it back in his place, and he was angry. He unleashed the anger of a three-year-old. And I learned a valuable lesson that day. That rocks that appear ordinary and nothing special to me are valuable to my three-year-old. Valuable in building his collection of rocks. And it made me think that maybe God is the same way. That maybe we think of ourselves as ordinary or nothing special, but yet we are valuable to the building of God's rock collection. A rock collection on which God will build the church into the future. Every rock unique and special and valuable. And so Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, Who do you think? I am. And I ask the question today, who do you think you are? Imagining that God doesn't count you among the most valuable rocks on which God will build the church into the future. And I add to that another question, and here it is. If you believe that Jesus said, you are the rock I'm going to build the church on, how might that change your life? How might it change your daily activity to think that God is counting on you for the building of God's church into the future? Well, let me tell you this. God is saying that. God does count on you. God does depend on you for the future of this church and the church universal. So, Let's talk about how the stories end. Peter, Jesus who? Remember him saying that? Peter would be one of the most powerful evangelists the world has ever known. Peter would become the bishop of Rome. Peter would die for his faith. Crucified. But he refused to be crucified like Jesus was crucified, church tradition holds because he felt he wasn't worthy, so he was crucified, what do you, do you know? Upside down. That's Peter. And Mother Teresa? Well, just under a year ago, Mother Teresa became Saint Teresa. She was canonized as a saint in the Catholic tradition after they discovered her faith was tremendously weak. And now she is Saint Teresa because she impacted the world for God's kingdom despite her weakness. So I summarize the life of Peter and the life of Mother Teresa in about a paragraph. And what if I were now summarizing your life in a paragraph? What would you want someone to say about you? Your legacy and whether you're 9 or you're 99, it's not too late to change what that legacy, what that paragraph will be. It's not too late to be the rock upon which love is built 
affecting the generations to come. Be that rock. Be that rock. Amen. Oh, my dear friends, you are precious in God's sight. You are a treasured jewel. Go and live like that. Go and be the rock that love find its foundation on. Amen.